This is South Korea today, the capital city, Seoul. In some ways, as modern, as with it, as anything in the Western world. Korea today seems like a very distant relative to that once war-ravaged land. It was a transformation so dramatic that it could only be described as a miracle. When the Korean War ended in 1953, South Korea was impoverished and stagnant. Today, it is the world's 12th largest economy, an incubator of cutting-edge technology and a potent cultural force. Great Decisions investigates South Korea's rapid development and examines its evolving partnership with the United States. South Korea, next on Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Hereford Foundation, PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation. When the Korean director Bong Joon-ho arrived at the Incheon airport, fresh off his dramatic victory at the Academy Awards, a jubilant crowd gathered to applaud a native son. South Korean public went absolutely crazy. They were so euphoric. They see it as having achieved something very special. Parasite's critical success was just one more reminder that Korean culture has become a global phenomenon. The success of Korean cultural exports has really, I think, changed the way that people around the world think about Korea. And it's also made Korea a very desirable place. Increasingly, as Korean culture gains salience and awareness here in the United States, there's a mutual respect. The Koreans are constantly true to their traditional values, but also mixing, matching, creating, and experimenting. The ascendance of Korean culture seems all the more remarkable to those who fully appreciate just how far South Korea has come. I remember it was an omnipresent sight, beggars on the streets at dinner time, begging for food, carrying tin cans. For South Korea to have achieved the level of freedom and democracy and wealth over the past couple of generations, this truly is a singular feat. To an American, the free soil of Korea is hallowed ground. As South Koreans emerged from the devastation of the Korean War, the U.S. stepped in to jumpstart the Korean economy. The U.S. and ROK entered into a formal alliance arrangement. So this gave South Korea the security space to develop its economy, to develop its domestic political system. Directly after the Korean War, all the natural resources and industrial factories were located in the north, and South Korea had nothing to rely on but human resources. The aid funds extended by the United States played a crucial role in post-war reconstruction effort. Steady streams of urgently needed supplies pour into Seoul and other Korean villages and cities. The tools and machines of industry, the fertilizer and equipment needed to restore the land to fertility. The driving force behind South Korea's modernization was a controversial military dictator named Park Jung-hee. At the height of the Cold War, 
Park was eager to strengthen his country's bond with the U.S., even when doing so provoked anger at home. South Korea was a key ally of the United States. The United States needed combat troops, and South Korea from 1965 to 1971 sent 300,000 combat troops to Vietnam. Some 3,000 ROC troops debark from their landing craft as reinforcements for Korean soldiery already active in the war. As the regiment continues to troop ashore, the Koreans fall into formation to march along the main street of Quinong. Opposition Korean politicians rightfully pointed out that South Korea would be akin to playing the role of mercenary in supporting the U.S. war campaign. And by 1971, you have about one billion U.S. dollars flowing into the South Korean economy. South Korea was also able to gain from normalizing relations with Japan, which was able to happen because Park Chung-hee was an authoritarian ruler, and it was a very unpopular decision. Although Park relied on American support, he was determined to forge his own path when it came to modernizing South Korea's economy. Park Chung-hee wanted to focus on the development of heavy industry in, in Korea, and the key heavy industry would be the steel industry. The World Bank thought it would be inefficient. Nevertheless, President Park persisted. He gambled, and that gamble paid off. We tend to believe markets are always the most efficient. But the Korean government went against market forces. They picked winners. They didn't let competition uh, decide who, which companies were going to survive. Park built close partnerships with South Korea's largest companies, family-run conglomerates known as chaebols. The term jaebol refers to large industrial conglomerates within the Korean economy. A jaebol is a business group where ownership and management are both concentrated within a single family. Samsung, Hyundai, LG, and SK, those are the four big ones. What makes the Chable unique from other companies around the world is their sprawl and their size. Most Chable groups make pretty much everything they can. The South Korean economic development model is one of the government playing a very aggressive role by subsidizing key strategic industries and colluding with big businesses. The founder of Samsung, Lee Byung-chol, realized that he could actually build not just a business empire, but the entire nation of South Korea with it. As South Korea blossomed into an economic powerhouse, American policymakers and business leaders grew frustrated with the protectionist policies that had fueled its development. In 2006, the two countries began the arduous process of negotiating a bilateral free trade agreement. I was the chief U.S. negotiator for the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement. I think there'll be a number of difficult issues um, but I don't envision any deal breakers. The goal was to open up our respective markets to each other and to integrate our two economies more closely. Before that time, the U.S. and Korea were basically adversaries. Korea wanted to sell its products all over the world, including to the U.S., while at the same time keeping its market closed. Almost all free trade agreements are controversial because there's winners and there's losers. In Korea, farmers were deeply opposed to the free trade agreement that would allow in U.S. beef, U.S. rice, U.S. soybeans. We are against the forcible agreement for free trade between South Korea and the United States, benefiting conglomerates, pro-U.S. officials, and men of influence. In 2008, the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, known by the acronym CHORUS, became a flashpoint in American electoral politics. During the campaign, President Obama was public about how he did not approve of the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement. And so when he took office, he instructed us to go back to the agreement and to renegotiate. The agreement we're announcing today includes several important improvements and achieves what I believe trade deals must do. In particular, manufacturers 
of American cars and trucks will have much more access to the Korean market. A divided Congress finally ratified the renegotiated Corus Agreement in 2011. The deal took effect the following year. We now are the largest supplier of beef to Korea, and we're now the second largest supplier of pork. U.S. investment in South Korea increased by over 20 percent, and Korean investment here in the United States increased by over 60 percent. By any measurement, Corus has been good for America and has been good for Korea, too. Once Korea completed the negotiations with us, our model became Korea's model. And so when it sat down with other countries around the world, it started to ask for similar things that we asked Korea to do. So in many ways, Korea became a great partner in helping to lift the standards of trade agreements around the world. But the drama surrounding Chorus was far from over. Once President Trump got into office, he started to walk back a number of U.S. trade agreements. He claimed the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement was harming American exports such as cars. So he wanted a renegotiation of this. We have a very bad trade deal with Korea. Very, very bad trade deal. It's, it's a deal that uh, it's incompetent that somebody could have made a deal like that. Some people were worried that it might cause tensions between the United States and Korea. However, despite these concerns, we approach the negotiations in good faith. The takeaway for the South Koreans was that President Trump basically needed just enough for him to spin it as a win. South Koreans were pretty happy with the result of the second round of negotiation with President Trump. They didn't feel they gave away too much. With the swift conclusion of the negotiations for the revision, uncertainty surrounding our free trade agreement has been eliminated. As a result, companies from both countries will now be able to do business under more stable conditions. The Koreans made some concessions. I think those did make the, the deal a little bit better for U.S. companies. And I think the Koreans very much want to keep this trade deal intact. And, and I think U.S. companies want to keep this trade deal intact. The reality is that the new chorus changed so little that it didn't need congressional approval. At the end of the day, we have an agreement that looks very similar uh, to what it looked before, but we invested a lot of political capital. Although American trade with South Korea has grown since chorus, the U.S. is not its biggest trading partner. South Korea's economic reliance on China puts Seoul in a tenuous position. China is South Korea's number one trading partner. China, South Korea trade is more than South Korea, United States, South Korea, Japan trade combined. So while U.S. obviously is still very important to South Korea in terms of economy and trade, uh, it's number two. It's not number one anymore. There has been a rise in uncertainty resulting from the U.S.-China trade dispute. The current economy survives by navigating the global supply chain. If Chinese exports are blocked from entering the United States market, this would inevitably have a negative impact on Korean export to China. The South Koreans have a saying that they are the shrimp among whales. They find themselves in a pretty tough neighborhood. The Chinese economic relationship looms large in South Korea. The rivalry between China and the United States has tested the ability of successive Korean governments to craft an independent foreign policy without antagonizing either Beijing or Washington. The relationship between South Korea and China and South Korea and the United States really puts Seoul in a delicate balancing act. They have to be careful not to go too far to, to alienate either one of them. The notion that the U.S. and China can somehow engage in this zero-sum strategic competition without having any major impact on its allies in the region, like South Korea and Japan, is false. And that is why American policymakers really need to pay closer attention to what policymakers in Seoul and Tokyo are saying. In recent years, the Chinese government has been quick to punish South Korea economically for any behavior it perceives as a threat. 
we saw this dynamic with uh, the decision by the United States to deploy that, the uh, theater high altitude uh, air defense system. It's a missile defense system that President Obama and South Korean President Park decided to deploy in 2016. Now, this was a system that the Chinese objected to quite strenuously, and it put Korea in a very uncomfortable position. Our missile defense cooperation, THAAD, is a purely defensive system to deter and defend against North Korean threats. China did not hesitate to bare knuckle pressure South Korea. Suddenly, all the group tours of Chinese tourists to South Korea stopped. The very large department store firm found that suddenly no one was coming into its shops. Korean performers going to China for very lucrative tours suddenly couldn't get their visas. Determined to check China's growing influence around the world, American national security officials from both parties view South Korea as a crucial base from which to pressure Beijing. I think in responding to China overall in this century, the U.S. needs to do more to have structures in East Asia and South Asia that put military partnerships in a, in a, in a more effective posture. As the United States pursues what is likely to be a long-term competition with China, our alliances, including Korea, are going to be a critical advantage. But the military partnership between the U.S. and South Korea has become increasingly strained. We're defending nations that are very wealthy. South Korea is a very wealthy nation. They make our television sets, they make ships, they make everything. From the moment he took office, Donald Trump began pressuring South Korea to spend more to offset the cost of basing more than 28,000 American soldiers in the country. Now they're paying a billion dollars a year. And I went to him again. I said, look, I'll be back because that's just a fraction. And uh, the, again, the relationship is uh, great, but it's just not a fair relationship. This is another aspect of the purely transactional Trump view of what the deployment of American forces around the world is about. I think that it is almost certainly true that other countries could spend substantially more on their own defense than they do. The, the problem is, in the Trump view, if they're not paying enough, we'll just come home. I think that's a big mistake. President Trump views the United States as a mercenary power. He wants to deploy our troops to places only where those nations will pay. Well, that's not why we send troops around the world. Our, our military is not a money-making operation for the federal government. This is a very strong alliance we have, but uh, Korea is a wealthy country and could and should pay more to help offset the cost of defense. The South Koreans are not free riders, uh, not even close. They are an unbelievably productive ally. The United States' largest overseas military base was recently completed, and that cost was around $10 billion, and the Koreans paid between 92 and 96% of those costs. Within South Korea, President Trump's burden-sharing demands fanned the flames of popular resentment. If you look at polling, there's only a very, very small minority, single digits of people who are sympathetic to U.S. demands to dramatically increase payments to the United States. The vast majority, over 90% of Koreans, are opposed to a vast increase. Our country really doesn't need you, Trump. Go back to your country quickly. And the Koreans feel like they've kind of been given a shakedown, and they don't like it. Uh, they feel insulted, I think, has, has undercut confidence in the relationship. Some experts worry that American policymakers are reluctant even to debate the received wisdom that the U.S. must maintain a permanent military presence in East Asia. That's premised on a particular view of what America should do, which is it should have a ring of forward deployed bases around the world. You could easily make an argument that the US doesn't need any of these bases. But in Washington, DC, the idea that the United States needs these bases is unquestioned. 
What has been missing in Washington is a robust debate. And I think in the case of South Korea, some people have a knee-jerk reaction against even talking about it. <laughs> They think it's very subversive or dangerous to suggest that U.S. troops should come home from South Korea 70 years after the Korean War. America is a Pacific power, a resident Pacific power. We are going nowhere. Nowhere. We need to have a presence in the Korean Peninsula because if North Korea were to overrun South Korea, that would be a disaster for our own interests, both in that region and all across the world. We just have that Cold War mentality that says we have to have forward bases. But the reality is our ability to project power from the United States around the globe is really substantial. I've been stationed in Korea. I've fought in four different combat environments. My assessment is that we don't need to be there. Today, analysts paint a picture of a complicated relationship. The vast majority of the South Korean people remain pro-US. However, paradoxically, outside the Middle East, we see on occasion the highest level of anti-U.S. sentiment and even virulent anti-U.S. protests were in South Korea. The older generation is grateful, but the folks who don't remember the Korean War or who didn't grow up in poverty, they have a very different view of the United States. They know that the democratization effort was achieved not with the help of the United States, but despite United States backing South Korean authoritarian rule. There's always going to be some lingering pockets of anti-Americanism, especially when there's a negative incident involving U.S. troops. But it's only a small minority of South Koreans who feel this way. 85% of South Koreans believe that U.S. troops are necessary today. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. American policymakers who respond forcefully to North Korea's provocations must walk a fine line. Millions of South Koreans still dream that reunification might someday be possible. Particularly with a president like Moon Jae-in in power, there really is a desire of saying, you know, we've waited long enough. South Korean fans gathered en masse tonight outside the ice hockey arena in Pyeongchang to voice their support for the unified Korean women's ice hockey team, which will take to the ice tomorrow for the first time in Olympic competition. Win or lose, the result doesn't matter. I hope they play their best with a unified mind, moving toward the reunification. I think Washington's view is keep the pressure on until North Korea comes to the table or to stay in stasis. That's a tension that has been present in a number of administrations in both Seoul and Washington. President Moon wants to do more to engage aggressively with the North, whereas the United States is a little more cautious. You're always going to have not a perfect alignment between the two allies, but I think that's perfectly natural. Yet despite the uncertainties in the U.S.-South Korea alliance, leaders in both countries understand that they have tied their nation's fates together. We share important values like democracy and a market economy. We learn from each other and appreciate each other's contribution. We have a famous saying that a tree with deep root will have many fruits. Koreans feel increasingly over the years that our shared values are genuine. They want American leadership. Doesn't mean that they think we're perfect. They know we're not. But absent an American voice, absent American values, they think the world is a much more dangerous place. Nearly seven decades have passed since South Korea emerged, battered but defiant, from the horrors of an all-consuming war. Since then, Ordinary Koreans have continued to battle, to revolutionize their economy, to build a democracy. 
and to earn respect on the global stage. Now, as Koreans look to the future, they must grapple with vexing questions about how to navigate a dangerous world. Great Decisions is America's largest discussion program on global affairs. Discussion groups meet online via Zoom and Google Meets, in person at community centers, libraries, places of worship, and homes across the country to discuss global issues with their community. Participants read the eight-topic briefing book, meet to discuss each topic, and complete a ballot which shares their views with Congress. To start or join a discussion group in your community, visit fpa.org or call 1-800-477-5836. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Herford Foundation, PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation.